Welcome. I'm Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm a hematologist oncologist, and I'm associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. In my professional life, I see patients, I teach trainees, and I do research in healthcare policy. This is Plenary Session. Plenary Session is a podcast at the intersection of medicine, oncology, and health policy, and you're listening to season three. On this week's episode, you're in store for a great conversation. I'm joined by Dr. John Yonides, and we meet up in person in Menlo Park. We talk about many things, his career from 2000 to 2010, the move to Stanford, and lastly, COVID, 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 because that's what you wanna hear about. We talk about COVID-19, his work on the topic from IFR to the shielding ratio to what policy ought to be, and finally schools. You won't wanna miss this far ranging interview. Stay tuned. If you like this podcast and want more content, follow me on Twitter at vprasadmdmph. Check out the YouTube channel, Vinay Prasad MDMPH. Patreon backers will get access to the slides for lectures I give on Plenary Session. Want to hear from us? Email us your question at plenarysessionpodcast at gmail.com. All right, I'm back, joined with John Yonides. We are meeting in person in a park, in Menlo Park, and following all the appropriate precautions. Uh, John, thanks so much for doing this podcast again. <laughs> thanks a million, Vinay. So much to talk about, uh, so much to talk about. Um, one of the things that I think I, I want to start by mentioning is, you know, this is, I think, only the third time I've actually seen you face-to-face -face in, what, a uh, decade or so. I, I think you're right. Yeah, I think we only met three times. I say that only because... Um, uh, uh, one of the allegations I've been uh, dealt with is that, you know, we are in fact close friends. We... <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, so I think people were saying, you know, you, it's, you, you know, you're only talking to him because you're friends. Obviously, we have dinner together. We have had many vacations together. <laughs> the truth is, of course, we are not. I mean, I... Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that, that means I have millions of friends. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I won't take it personally, but I, I, I think it's fair to say we're, yeah, we, we know of each other, but um, we're not friends. Um, um, and, um, and we haven't worked together in many years. Uh, we worked on a few papers together maybe about eight, nine years ago. Um, okay, first question for you. PA, what, are, what does the PA stand for? Okay, so, so these are middle initials, mm -hmm. and they come uh, from the names of my uh, father and my mother. So oh. it, it kind of got established very early on that I would write my name like that and uh, and it's gone since then yeah, and what are your fa then. father and mother's name uh, so Paul and uh, Angela I see I see so, so that's like just John Paul Angel uh -huh. it sounds like a little bit like a pope <laughs> <laughs> yeah it does it does so you know there's so much to talk about and I think at some point we're going to get to 2020 but I don't want to start with 2020 I want to start with um, you know in the first part of our interview that we did a few months ago um, I think we talked a little bit about your early career. Um, I'm, I'm very curious in the years 2000 to 2010. Now, these were um, years where you were finishing up with Tufts and you were working with Joseph Lau in the early 2000s. You moved back to Greece, and you were in Greece until 2010. Um, and if I were to look back at your career in these years, I think it was a very productive time for you. Um, a very, uh, you know, there's a moment in everyone's career where you feel like all the synapses are firing and you're doing a lot of things in a lot of domains and it's very exciting. And I'm curious what it was like for you in those years. Um, you know, you wrote on many topics. You had a nice team in Greece. Um, what drew you to Greece? What made you go back? And, you know, what did you do in those years? So the, these were uh, very interesting years and uh, I, I grew up in Greece. Uh, so uh, Greece has always been in my mind uh, as a destination. Uh, I'm kind of split between two continents, two countries, uh, two civilizations. I cannot uh, really mm -hmm. get rid of that uh, schizophrenic uh, situation. And uh, uh, at some point, uh, that opportunity arose to be the chair of a department at a medical school and you were in Greece. And, and you were young when you I did. was very young yeah. at that time. So I was recruited when I was uh, uh, 33, uh, which is uh, a very uh, unusual yeah. opportunity for someone who's young. Yeah. And uh, I remember that some of my mem mentors uh, in, in Boston and uh, uh, NIH uh, and, and Hopkins uh, 
uh, thought that I was crazy. What are you going to do? And uh, <laughs> are you sure? Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I thought that it was uh, a really great opportunity to, to try to do something on my own, with, with my own signature, with all its uh, strengths and weaknesses, uh -huh. uh, without uh, really having someone impose on me uh, what the agenda should be in the department and uh, what I should prioritize and what I should focus. So I went there. I found uh, an amazing number of amazing people, uh, young people, uh, and uh, somehow they heard that uh, there's that crazy guy uh, <laughs> from the U.S. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and uh, uh, why don't we try to, to see him? Uh, I was uh, working very long hours. I would, I would be there. Uh, literally from early in the morning until midnight you were, I see. Uh, and people knew that my door was always open and uh, uh, that's how I met lots of brilliant people who just uh, dare to open that door <laughs> and come in <laughs> and, and, and they see. had some very nice ideas and we could brainstorm we could then meet with the rest of the team uh, so I, I really felt that I could create a department uh, uh, just as I would dream a department to be, uh, rather than have to start from something that had uh, a very long and established history and you just couldn't move uh, a piece of paper from uh, one uh, corner of the desk to the other yes. <laughs> without asking permission from the, uh, the souls of the leaders and uh, <laughs> the spirits of the, <laughs> mm -hmm. of the deceased uh, chairs. <laughs> there were fewer entrenched interests when you're in a small department in, um, in Greece. Yes, I, I think that uh, you could have more control yeah. of uh, what you wanted to do. I could uh, really build an agenda around uh, things like evidence-based medicine, yeah. uh, clinical epidemiology, molecular epidemiology. Uh, so things that uh, most established departments in the U.S. and in Europe were kind of very reluctant to even touch upon. Mm -hmm. uh, they w were stuck pretty much in their excellence <laughs> 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 while I was venturing into that unknown and mm -hmm. uh, high risk and uh, questionable territory in uh -huh. a sense. And some of the people who came to you, um, I'm going to mispronounce the name, but like Tazioni. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Athena. Athena, Athena. Tazioni, yeah. Some of these people who you worked with, you worked with quite a lot. I mean, many papers over the course of a decade. Um, and they had diverse clinical interests. Some were neurologists, cardiologists. Is that fair to say, too? Yes. Uh, the, the, the nice thing is that the, the University of Ath uh, Vianina, the, uh, the medical school is, is very tightly knit with uh, the university hospital. So l literally, the medical school and the university hospital are next to each other. They're in the same campus. Uh, it's walking distance. So lots of young people who were trainees, they were residents, they were fellows, some of them young attendings, uh, and, and less so some senior staff. You know, once you're a senior professor, probably you have gelled in terms yes. of what your interests are. Yes. But, but lots of young people from very different specialties came and joined the team. And also all the other disciplines were on the same campus. Uh, it's, it's, it's a large campus, uh, surprisingly large. Uh, so you could have people from social sciences and people from mathematics and uh, people from modeling and uh, uh, decision sciences uh, on the same campus that you could meet. And uh, uh, I think that that's really the ideal situation. It's pretty much the same thing at Stanford. Uh, you feel uh, that way. Same compact campus yeah. that you can walk across. You yeah. can have a peripatetic uh, <laughs> uh, approach to, to science. Uh, unfortunately, the campus is closed for about a year now. <laughs> but when it is open, yes. or when it will be open, I, I look forward to having the same type of uh, experience again. I would say, um, you know, if I were to stand back and look at those years 2000 to 2010, it was... Um, you know, an important time in your career, because probably in 2000, there were some people who knew of you. Um, but by 2010, I think, you know, most people in medicine who are interested in evidence-based medicine and meta-research um, knew of your work and, and knew of the different things you had done. So it's sort of, um, to some degree, um, a coming-of-age time for you in terms of career, in terms of professional um, development. And, you know, the range of topics you hit, you know, um, SSRIs, um, you know, you did some work on that in that decade. You did work on Framingham um, and, 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 and risk uh, predictions that claim to go beyond what they've done in Framingham. You did work on concordance between observational and randomized control trials, um, sort of these fundamental questions that still plague us to this day. Um, do, you, do you look back fondly on those years as a time of, I mean, you got to, you got to experiment and work in so many different spaces. 
I, I, I really loved that time. Yeah. It, it was uh, very stimulating, uh, very creative. I think that I learned a lot. I, I think that um, uh, it, it, it had lots of uh, what one might call ideal circumstances, which included very limited funding. <laughs> <laughs> but, go, but go on, yeah. Or, or, Sometimes or, that or helps. close to no funding, no funding actually. Uh-huh. You know, Greece, uh, unfortunately, has not invested uh, much in, in research. Uh, and uh, like most uh, developed countries, uh, research funding goes to the well-connected. So I was uh, scoring probably the lowest in terms of connectivity. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. I think that people recognized that I was doing something interesting, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, I, I would not hope to get much funding. Uh, I also have uh, an allergy to getting funding from uh, uh, for-profit entities, uh-huh. so I, I don't get this type of funding. So uh-huh. I was already excluding myself yes. from uh, other sources. But uh, this meant that uh, we could deal with questions that are important, uh, which you need very little or no money to deal with. You need a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, you don't need to spend millions of dollars. You just need to spend your time, effort, and brain cells, uh, which are destroyed while you're doing this. <laughs> uh, and uh, in a sense, I saw that as an advantage. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I think that the team was fueled largely, if not purely, by enthusiasm, yeah. which is, to me, the, the best that can happen to you. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I, I feel similarly similarly about my first five years of my faculty career in Oregon. Um, you know, uh, we did have some funding, but it was not the funding that led to projects. It was always... You know, when you get somebody walking in your door who's motivated, they're often a trainee, a resident, a fellow. They have their own life. They have their own funding. They have their own day job. But they're interested to do a project. Those are often people who are, um, who bring so much energy to the project. And then you have to think of something you can do with existing data that costs nothing, right? So it's kind of a, a puzzle to some degree. It, it is. But, but I think that there's so many opportunities. And in a sense, you have low competition to tackle these type of questions yeah. because most uh, of the let's say quote unquote excellent scientists in in the US and in Europe uh, they kind of orient their research agenda to where the funding is yes uh, where they will get more money because inherently they believe that this was the way that they will get more members in their team and they will get more materials and more resources and and they will be able to do more which means that they immediately abandon Tons of extremely fascinating territory mm-hmm. that simply has no funding. Yes. But it's far more interesting than, than the ridiculous minutiae that are being funded. Yes. So I, I, I'm not telling people to commit suicide by <laughs> avoiding getting any funding. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. but, but I think it should not be their priority. Mm-hmm. And I, I really feel bad when institutions make that a priority. Yeah. It, it just means that they have lost track of what science is and what scholarship is. Yeah, I think... Um, At this point in my career, I know some people who their time is preoccupied with thinking about the next funding, getting funding, amassing funding, to the point with which the time spent on thinking about science and reading science and thinking about where where the, the, the cutting edge of the science is, is, is secondary to, to, I think you've called them sort of talented money managers who have a high side hobby of science. Yeah, I, I think we have promoted managers practically, even in top universities. Uh, I, I don't say that to sly anyone uh, because this is a great talent, I, I have to say. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I think that some of these people are amazingly smart, amazingly brilliant, uh, extremely competent, uh, which, which makes it also hard for people like me who is you know, largely incompetent to, <laughs> <laughs> to compete against them. <laughs> well... These days, that's, uh, that's everyone's favorite thing to say, but uh, for many years, I don't think many people said it. So I'm curious, um, 2010. 2010 was the year you moved to Stanford from, uh, from Greece. And Greece was coming out of the financial crisis in 2008, and there were some controversial austerity measures. And I guess I'm curious about that move. Um, and of course, here, the chair at the time was Ralph Horowitz, who I think, of course, you... Um, Ralph must think highly of you. I mean, I, I would imagine that that is the case. Ralph, of course, was, I believe, before Stanford, he was the chairman at Yale, and then he came over to Stanford to be chair. Um, he was someone interested in meta-research before it even sort of had that name, um, and he had done some projects in that space, and, and he still remains, I think, a, a clever and thoughtful person. And I guess I don't know this to be true, but I assu- always assumed that he was probably instrumental in bringing you out here. Um, and I also assumed that it probably was a bit push-pull. It was the pull of Stanford, but also things in Greece may not have been 
great for science in those moments. I wonder if you might talk about what led to that change. Of course. So, so Ralph, indeed, uh, was instrumental, but I, I think that there were also many other uh, senior uh, leadership uh, people at uh, Stanford who also were very strongly supportive and enthusiastic. And uh, at, at, at that point, uh, I had no inclination to, to move uh, from Ioannina. I, I was receiving lots of uh, offers uh, or you know, people approaching me from top universities in the U.S. and Europe uh, whether I wanted to, to move and become department chair in their epidemiology or equivalent departments. Uh, and I, I was always replying, you know, thank you very much. I'm really honored, but uh, I feel that I have some mission or, <laughs> or vision or whatever to, to continue in, uh, in Ioannina. And... Um, when uh, when the the Stanford situation arose, uh, something similar happened. Uh, uh, I think it was Ralph, uh, uh, along with Phil Pizzo, who was the, the dean at that time, uh, you know, mentioned that uh, there is that opportunity for uh, leading uh, a division uh, in uh, SBRC at, at Stanford and. Uh, why don't you come and see? And I said, uh, well, thank you. I'm not really interested. That's an amazing <laughs> honor, but uh, uh, why don't you come and see? <laughs> so, so I did come and see, and uh, my wife, Despina, came with me, and uh, also my daughter came with me. And uh, everybody seemed to be so supportive and so enthusiastic, and uh, you know, they really made a very strong case that, that they won me. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I asked my wife and my daughter, I told them, you have uh, veto power, uh -huh. what do you think? And they said, you know, go ahead, try it. It, it, it was like these decisions that uh, you don't know why and how you, you make them, but, but uh, people seem to be so stellar at Stanford and so enthusiastic and so supportive. And uh, I felt that I already had more than 10 years uh, in Ioannina. Uh, and uh, maybe it was time for, for a new step. Now, in terms of push and pull, I would say that uh, Greece, unfortunately, has been very hard hit by a series of crises, not just a single crisis. There, there was the initial crisis in 2008, but things got worse. While other countries uh, improved, uh, things got worse for Greece, and that was very unfortunate. I was... Uh, seeing that many of my most talented young researchers, I had to just let them go elsewhere, which is not a bad thing, of course, but, but not in Greece. Some of them became professors in Greece, but the vast majority became professors in other institutions in, in, Europe. in the U.S. or, or in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I felt that that was part of the, the Greek fate of uh, having to leave, a little bit like uh, Ulysses. Mm -hmm. uh, you leave uh, for a short trip mm -hmm. to just mm -hmm. conquer that little Troy, and uh -huh. then it takes 20 years before you're back, yeah. if you ever manage to mm -hmm. get back. <laughs> I, was, I was seeing that in, in the younger generation. I said, well, I, I belong to the young generation, so what are you doing here? <laughs> mm -hmm. Get out of here. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh -huh. And um, that is a shame, isn't it, about Greece? I know you've written about this. You're, it's a topic that's near and dear to your heart. I think uh, you pride yourself in the fact that Greece should have an academy to rival the world. Yes, I, I, I believe that Greece has uh, amazing scientific capacity. Uh, I, over the years I have uh, tried to map uh, the scientific workforce of, of Greek scientists. We uh, recently even generated uh, a complete list of mm -hmm. uh, people who are of uh, Greek origin uh -huh. and uh, about 94% of those who are at the top of their disciplines are not in Greece. I see. So if, if these people could be in Greece, Greece would have been a superpower mm -hmm. in, in research. I mean, currently it's one among many uh, Western European countries, uh, not at the top by any means, uh, but if these people could be in Greece uh, and, of course, attract also other people from I'm, I'm not a nationalist yeah, <laughs> of any uh -huh, sort uh -huh. uh, if, if you could really attract excellence from the entire world I, I think that that country would have a completely different future and I, I think that applies to any country I was going to ask you isn't yeah. the brain drain true of, for of India course. for it's China the same for yeah. India, it's the same for for any country yeah. it's uh, uh, 
and and it, it's not an issue of, of, of nationalism or thinking about uh, uh, one country having priority over uh, another. I think that what makes Stanford special is that it has managed to attract people from all over the world mm -hmm. who are the best in what they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, if at some point Stanford does not want to do that, you know, Stanford will become the university of unknown. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind. It, it's it's not that you are granted privileged status just because you have a name. It's it's your willingness to be open to be to attract talent, no matter where that talent comes from. To be tolerant of difference, of divergence, <laughs> of uh, uh, of people who have new ideas, bold ideas, mm -hmm. seemingly dangerous ideas Dead sometimes. Bits, yes, uh, mm -hmm. but, but I think that. It's that tolerance and, and that magnanimity and openness that uh, eventually creates uh, great universities or destroys great universities. <laughs> mm. These uh, values you speak of, I mean, these are fundamentally enlightenment values. They're values that go back a long time in Western civilization. Um, do you think those values are under crisis in this moment? Some people say that the enlightenment is dead. Uh, and uh, occasionally I wonder whether that's true. I, th I think that uh, if enlightenment means tolerance, we see a lot of intolerance nowadays. Uh, if, if it means uh, giving the ability to people who have uh, completely opposite ideas to express them, defend them, present them, then we see very little of that happening at the moment. If it means uh, uh, believing in science yeah. uh, and... Uh, this means skepticism, uh, organized skepticism, uh, replication, transparency, and uh, communality, then uh, again, uh, I think that we're not really doing that great. Uh, I, I don't want to be a doomsayer because <laughs> I think every day is a new day, yeah. and it starts from scratch, and uh, you can wake up and say, oh goodness, we've done it so wrong <laughs> yesterday and last month and last year uh -huh. it's time to get it right uh -huh. uh, so and I think that there's still lots of people who want to get it right uh -huh. so I'm, I, I'm not willing to say that the enlightenment has been thoroughly defeated <laughs> uh, but it is going through some hard times at the <laughs> moment <laughs> but I think to some degree one of the the the, the, the sort of the way in which it's sort of reinforcing is that the best place to have certain dialogues is face-to-face, -face, um, as we're sitting across from each other or a group of people at a table. And the present moment has made those face-to-face -face encounters very unlikely to occur. And so the encounters have moved to an arena where escalation, polarization, demonization are all rewarded by the nature of the arena, the impersonality of the arena, the, the way in which the arena rewards um, people who like and retweet and follow um, and so, you know, the, it's, it's, I think, I, I, I believe that if the Enlightenment values are on life support, they have a chance of recovery, but I think it will take in-person interactions. I fully agree. I, I think that uh, without in-person interaction, uh, you can have disinhibition of the, the worst sentiments and emotions of, of anger and uh, uh, scorn and uh, uh, just not recognizing that you're dealing with people. If, if you have someone in front of you and you know, you're looking at that person in the eyes, yeah. then it's completely different compared to if you're with your uh, Twitter account or your Facebook or, or even Zoom. Yeah. Uh, th that person is, is no longer material. It, yeah. it, it's just uh, a construct. Yeah, so so, 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 so yeah. you can really insult someone who's not a person, but it, it would be far more difficult to insult someone who you see in front of you being a human being. It, it's very easy to dismiss someone who's not a person. It's, it's very easy to uh, think that you're alone, that uh, you possess all the truth that there is on, on planet Earth, because literally there's no one next to you. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, you possess all the truth, but the truth is very limited, sorry, <laughs> uh, that you possess. And I, I feel that this is one of the, of the worst circumstances and, and the, the worst consequences mm -hmm. of, uh, of the pandemic and the lockdown measures, that it has really ab abolished that personal interaction, the, the ability to put f faces in, in real life. Uh, it, it makes a tremendous difference. We're not robots, we're not AI software, we are humans. 
Yeah, that's well said. Now, I, I hope you'll indulge me this. Um, I feel compelled to do this because I think it's... I, I wanted to talk to you, of course, about COVID-19. How can, how can one not? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I, and, I, and I want to ask you... I get, I, I'm going to ask you at some point some tough questions. Um, but before I get to the tough questions, I want to start with your Wikipedia page. And here's why I want, I want to read it to you, and then we can talk about it. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to talk about... The, I'm going to read the part on COVID-19. I guess I'm, I will admit at the outset, I'm dissatisfied with how it's written. I think it's not fairly written. And I think if one were to read your Wikipedia page, the Wikipedia page is of some other academics who have espoused similar lines of thinking, the Wikipedia page for the Great Barrington Declaration, and then the Wikipedia page for the Jon Snow Memorandum, one would feel as if all these Wikipedia pages have been written by someone who signed the Jon Snow Memorandum. <laughs> Like, it's like it's like the uh. Great Barrington Declaration. It's like signed by a bunch of assholes. <laughs> John Snow Memorandum. The greatest minds of the world unite. I mean, it's really the it's really something. Um, and and I guess I want to say, you know, I appreciate people feel passionate for the positions they hold. Uh, who, you know, I've felt so passionate about my positions. Um, and but I do hope that in time there will be some sort of objectivity and nuance added to these kinds of things. But let me read you yours. Yep. Okay. We'll go through it a little bit. I think maybe some of it's unfair, but some of it I think maybe we can talk about. Okay. In an editorial on STAT published March 17, 2020, John Unides called the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic a, quote, once-in-a-century evidence fiasco, end quote, and wrote that lockdowns were likely an overreaction to unreliable data. Now, I guess I would criticize that sentence a little bit by pointing out that I don't think you... You said that the lockdown measures were an evidence fiasco. You said that it was a fiasco that while we were doing these broad sweeping measures, we were not actually engaged in collecting data that would remedy uh, the uncertainty um, in terms of anything like random survey, zero prevalence surveys across the country. Uh, exactly. So, so that sentence is completely wrong uh, because uh, actually I was one of the strongest supporters of uh, uh, draconian lockdown measures at that time and I, I even said you know why didn't we do it earlier mm. uh, now you know maybe I was wrong <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. but 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 I was one of the supporters and and actually I was not mm. underestimating the the risk uh, I, I see that uh, there are some people for example who have commented that I underestimate the risk while I was saying that we have a serious problem uh, and these same people were giving uh, uh, interviews about how low the risk is uh, for example I remember my my great uh, colleague, uh, you know, wonderful scientist, uh, Gavin Yame, who has been very critical, uh, he had a video at that time in Francois or something, or some French television, saying that if I am infected, uh, he was 50 years old, the risk of dying is zero. Zero. Mm. Zero. You know, putting emphasis on zero. I was not saying it was zero. I was saying that we lacked data. That we had a very serious problem that we had to act very urgently and lockdown was the proper thing to do. I, I gave multiple interviews in the US, in Greece, in Germany, in France, in the UK that we had to go into lockdown, but we needed data because we just couldn't navigate that space without data. And as you see now, we're still navigating that space a year later. <laughs> without data. Well, with some data, with, yeah. with more data than we had then. So the fiasco was about the lack of data. data. That's my understanding of... Yeah. I read your piece recently. It's, it's very clear. Anyone who reads the piece will get that. Well. <laughs> <laughs> or should get that. Well, and, and, I Unless don't know they read true. the vandalized Wikipedia page. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's what I'm going to get to. But no, I mean, I think um, people... To read something, you need to be in an emotionally neutral space. And if you're not emotionally neutral, you'll read it the way you want to read it. I, I, I agree. Yeah. But, but at the same time... Uh, something that is written is testimony. Uh, yes. uh, that so someday you cannot, somebody You cannot will. really distort that. You can distort your interpretation, but you cannot distort what is written. Uh, well, you are a believer, as I am, that in the long run, you know, objective interpretations will, will prevail, um, which I think they, they, I hope they continue to do. Um, but would you say it is fair that in March, um, you were one of the first people concerned with the implications of prolonged lockdown? Yes. Although you okay, and absolutely, because you do it for you keep it locked down for two months, three months, four months, five months, you're going to get some problems. Absolutely, I, I, lockdown. If it were something that we would get rid of the virus within a few weeks or even a month or two, 
that would probably be no issue, even if, even if it were not very effective, which we had no clue about how effective exactly we'll it might be. That, yeah. uh, you know, the the harms would be reversible, hopefully very quickly. You know, some people might lose their job for a short period of time, but you could support them for a month or two, and then they would get their jobs back. Um, mental health would suffer for a while, but then people would be rejoiced that we got rid of this and we would have an even better situation than we started. If it was short. If it was short. If, if it, it was, was just a month or two. But I was worried because in the history of, of pandemics, uh, I'm trained in infectious diseases. I, I haven't seen this type of pandemic just go away with, uh, with week, within weeks. <laughs> so so I, I was getting prepared for something that might have been several years and the, the notion that we will just shut down everything for several years was just shivering. Mm, let's come to that. But, okay, I want to finish this thing because there's a few more things that I wanted to point out. Okay, so then Mark Lipsitz, director of the Center for Communicable Disease and Dynamics at Harvard Chan School of Public Health, objected to this characterization of the global response and reply that was published the next day. I think that's fair. He, he, he um, had a different sort of reply. I thought, I thought it was published two days later, but whatever. Yeah, yeah we, we talked yeah. with Mark that same yeah. day that I published my yeah. stat piece. Uh, because he wrote a very vehement uh, tweet, uh, tweet uh, <sighs> yes. which I thought did not represent what I was saying. So mm-hmm. I, I talked with him, and I thought that we understood each other. And mm-hmm. I told him that, no, we are on the same wavelength. And then he wrote uh, that piece where he clearly did not understand or did not show that he understood what I was saying. Uh-huh. Uh, and it's unfortunate that uh, Mark is, is an amazing scientist. I have sent him congratulations multiple times. But, but some quotes that he has uh, spread, I, I think, I'm, I'm worried probably the, the fact checkers and the quotation checkers probably never reach out to him. Mm. Let's go to the next one. The next paragraph, they've moved away from your work to talk about this White House meeting. Okay, in March 2020, Yonides tried to organize a meeting at the White House where he and colleagues would caution President Donald Trump against, quote, shutting down the country for a very long time and jeopardizing so many lives in doing this, end quote. According to a proposal he submitted, the meeting did not come to pass, but on March 28th, after Trump said he wanted the country reopened by Easter, Yonides wrote to his colleagues, quote, I think our ideas have infiltrated the White House regardless, end quote. I guess my objection to this paragraph is... I believe it is a bit non sequitur for, you know, uh, in terms of your work in this space. But I also think, um, I guess, I think there is, an, there is an injustice in this space, which is that if, if many people supported prolonged and, and, and lengthy lockdowns and they tried to meet with the president or other administrators to, to push those ideas forward, I think um, we would say that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do. You believe in that, you push for that. Um, I think they're accurate in this space that you were likely concerned with um, the length of the time that the country would be locked down um, and that there will be countervailing harms the longer you stay locked down, which I think is inevitable. We will someday have a mountain of paper, maybe whole departments devoted to implications of prolonged lockdown. Um, And I guess what I find troubling about this paragraph is I think it's, it's... it, it seems like it's trying to disparage you for wanting to take your ideas and and turn them into policy when anyone with the other set of ideas, if they turn it into policy, that would be perfectly acceptable. And I guess what I want to say is the standard can't be, you know, d- that it's bad if you disagree with the ideas. The standard has to be, are scientists allowed to push for their ideas? And I guess I think scientists are allowed to push for their policy ideas. Why the hell not? That's what I've done for a decade in cancer drug policy. That's what everyone is doing in whatever way. And so I guess if people want to fault you, the fault should be they should say, you know, the specific things they disagree with about your policies, but not necessarily that you sought to promote them. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? So in, in principle, uh, I'm not the type of person who wants to promote uh, my ideas, including in, in the current circumstances. Uh, I felt that there was lots of information missing. Uh, we didn't have data to respond in what was a, really a major crisis. There was a lot at stake. So I thought that getting together uh, a number of people who were really top-notch and uh, uh, top caliber in, in their fields, uh, and very complementary fields, Uh, All of them are among the most highly cited scientists in the world. Uh, uh, One was a Nobel laureate. Uh, uh, Several of them were were deans or uh, uh, similar high-level administration people in uh, Berkeley. Twitter Twitter uh, says they're they're all terrible people And and (laughs) Yale. uh, (laughs) They're all terrible people now. So so I I think that that was really a dream team in in a sense. And and these people, I don't think that, that 
we agreed that there was a single plan that we all said that's the thing that needs to be done. So and one was Sten Vermond, who debated you in a monk debate of prior course. to that. And he um, has a different policy recommendation than I thought you were espousing. Absolutely. And this is why I tried to get Stan on board, because uh-huh. I wanted to make sure that we, we have a very uh, broad range of opinions. So uh, that was an effort to try complementarity, opposing views, uh, interdisciplinarity. We had people who were working in um, mathematical sociology, in infectious diseases, uh, in policy, in uh, epidemiology, in uh, all sorts of complementary disciplines that, that you really want to have on board in trying to, to generate some interesting ideas and, and some possibilities for a plan. Uh, we all agreed that we needed data. And and I, I, I think that when I said that uh, our, our ideas are infiltrating, it, it, to me, at, at that time, it seemed that people were saying that, yes, we need to get data. <laughs> but from, from, from that point to the interpretation that some um, blogs and, uh, and uh, tweets uh, suggested that I was uh, l- lobbying or, or, or whatever, this is uh, completely outrageous. It, 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 it makes no sense that I would be lobbying getting on board people who uh, disagreed <laughs> on yes. what is to be lobbied about. <laughs> yes, uh, so if you were in the lobbying business, why are you getting stand? Um, but I, I actually would even push back on you. I mean, I guess I don't know. I mean, your answer is, is fair to me. But I would say, if you, if you looked at me, I will lobby on the things I believe in. I don't, yeah, of course. I think cancer drugs cost too much. So if there's a panel and I yeah. can go and insert my opinion, I'm going to say you should negotiate prices lower the price. And I think the drugs shouldn't be approved based on surrogate endpoints. So if there's a panel, I'm going to go and I'm going to, and there are lots of people in oncology who disagree with me. So I guess I don't want to say, you can't fault me for pushing for what I believe in. You can say I'm stupid and I'm wrong or whatever, but I, I don't see how the desire to, I mean, you know, if, if, we have to assume that uh, people are acting in good faith. I mean, they're doing yes. what they believe is best. So I, yeah. I don't want to discredit someone who wants to lobby. Yes, I don't want to discredit yes. advocates. I don't right, want to, exactly. to discredit someone that's who wants saying. to be an advisor and uh, uh, kind of push for some big idea. Yeah. I, I have great respect for people who are well-intentioned and want to do that. And to be honest, there's so many causes that are worth fighting for, like climate change, getting rid of the tobacco industry. Our, our world has been facing so many crises that we don't recognize beyond the coronavirus crisis. So advocates and lobbyists who want to fight for these causes, uh, I think that that's amazing. Myself, I don't consider myself an advocate. Nice. Or uh, you know, Some people are more talented in this. I don't consider that I have a talent in advocacy. I try to stick to the science as much as I can. And anyone who says that I could be a lobbyist, not only inviting people who disagree with me, but also not having any social media, not having a Twitter account, not having Facebook, not trying to be an influencer, never appearing <laughs> anywhere. Yeah. It's, it's completely crazy to say that uh, yeah, I was not, uh... struggling for advocacy. It, it's exactly the opposite. I I was trying to say, can we have a down-to-earth kind of uh, very science-oriented, very tempered, very careful approach to where we are, what do we know, what is it that we do not know, and then try to see where we go from here. Not to say that I know the truth and, you know, this is what you need to do to to save the world. Okay. I got got two more paragraphs. (laughs) Yeah, but, the, but, but, the vandalized page has become too long, I guess. I, I haven't uh-huh. even checked it. I, I, don't, I, don't I think look. <laughs> I shouldn't look. <laughs> well, I yeah. guess, well, I, recently, um, one of, uh, you know, I, I've invited some trouble on my head because I said something about vaccines being good, God forbid. <laughs> and um, and uh, I was accused of, um, of um, writing my own. And I was like, I didn't oh, write goodness. it. Oh, <laughs> goodness. That's, that's the bad thing about Wikipedia pages that uh, anyone can really vandalize it. Yeah. With, and with complete nonsense. And, well, uh, of course, you're not going to change your own page. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I think it's a shame. It's, it's really a, a shame. Well, I guess... I, but uh, please, uh, yes. No, I want to... I, wanna, I, wanna, <laughs> I, I do think it's a shame. I think... I don't know. It's... The vandalization is telling me something, too, about where people are emotionally. And I think that that's not good. But let me, let me finish yeah. my, my point. And then I'm going to ask you some tougher questions. Okay. Yonidis widely promoted a study of which he had been a co-author. Okay. Well, this is also, I think, I don't <laughs> like the way it's written because 
every everybody who writes a study promotes their own fucking study. I mean, God, fuck. I mean, of course. I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, people who promoted. I mean, every study I've ever done. I, you can't fault somebody for. Anyway, I don't like that. Okay. Yonidis widely promoted a study of which he'd been a co author. Antibodies, seroprevalence in Santa Clara County, released as a preprint. Okay. It asserted that Santa Clara County number of infections was more than 50 times higher than official count, putting the virus IFR as low as 0.1 to 0.2. I think that's that's accurate. Yeah. Um, Yonidis concluded from the study that the coronavirus is, quote, not the apocalyptic problem that we thought, end quote. I think that quote's a little unfair because, I mean, I guess some might say this is a serious threat and many people have died and that is a tragedy. But what does an apocalypse mean? I think it is in the eye of the beholder. Um and some might say that it is not yet an apocalypse. Some might say it is. It has reached apocalyptic proportions. I don't know the answer. The message found favor with right-wing media outlets, with paper dismayed epidemiologists who said... <laughs> <laughs> Of course, all the epidemiologists were dismayed, who said testing was inaccurate and the methods were sloppy. Writing for Wire, David Friedman said the Santa Clara study compromised Yonidi's previous excellent reputation and meant that future generations of scientists may remember him as, quote, the fringe scientist who pumped the bad study that's what a right-wing conspiracy theory in the midst of a massive health crisis, end quote. On May 11th, the study authors revised the study with new figures. Okay. I wow. Guess, I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I haven't seen that. <laughs> I guess I would say, I would say the things that trouble me about it is... I actually don't think that's what David Friedman's article said. I think he, you know, this is David Friedman who in 2010 wrote a very flattering piece about you in the Atlantic. Uh -huh. um, and, um, you know, I think led many people to think of you as a, a seminal thinker in science, um, people outside of, outside of science and medicine. Um, and I think he, uh, he, I think, does have a different view than you did in that moment. And his article that he wrote recently about you and this article they're citing I think was a little critical. Um, I think he would say that, um, I think it was critical, but I don't think he made the, the claim that, that people are going to remember you as a fringe scientist. Okay? <laughs> I, I, I don't think, I, it wasn't that critical. I, I don't think that he wrote that. I don't think he, yeah, I, I don't yeah. think he wrote that. And certainly, yeah, I remember reading that article. Okay, I think, you know, I mean, this IFR point one to point two. I think we were going to, we could talk about that a little bit, but I mean, I think you that whatever changes were made to the manuscript, including the conference interval, you continue to believe that that was the IFR in Santa Clara County at that moment. And interestingly, I don't think anyone did a Santa Clara County study other than you all to say what it was in that moment. Does anyone, like, the, the gold standard for refuting the Santa Clara study that you are one of many co-authors on would be to do such a study in Santa Clara County at that time and tell us what the IFR is. There's no such stu other study, is there? Yeah, th there's uh, one study uh, that included S Santa Clara, which okay. is part of the study that uh, Julie Parsonet and uh, Glenn Certo uh, did uh, with uh, hemodialysis uh, patients, uh, which is a national study, but it, it has a pretty large sample from okay. Santa Clara. But, but it's a subset of hemodialysis, not average people. Y yes, okay. uh, so it's, uh, it's about two months uh, later, okay. and the calculated uh, IFR is exactly the same. As okay. as we found, point one five. Uh, it, yeah, point point two. Okay. I, you know, I, I think our estimate was point one eight. So, uh, I, I think that uh, also, if you look at the current data for California, especially for Santa Clara and for the vicinity, uh, even if you look at the case fatality rate, is uh, somewhere in the range of uh, one percent, and it's extremely unlikely that we have not missed at least four, four out, of out of five. Sure. So you know, you you have validation in. Different many ways. different ways that the the number was correct, uh, and and, I, you, I, and I, you believe the number is correct. To oh, day. absolutely! Uh, the, okay. You know, the paper has been accepted by a major journal. It, it should appear uh, soon, um, and um, it has also led to some other interesting work uh, that uh, we have done with uh, uh, Ellen Kuhn uh, from uh, engineering, uh, mechanical engineering here at Stanford, that uh, was also published and. Uh, some other methodological work because some of the very, very interesting questions that were raised were about the the methods and the calculation of uncertainty in such circumstances. So along with colleagues from uh, uh, biomedical uh, uh, data science and, uh, and computer science uh, at Stanford, we have done some work to develop new methods. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm grateful to all the people who made critical comments uh, on a scientific basis. Very quickly. Very quickly, <laughs> uh, and very free, and we, and we literally got more than a thousand scientific uh, yeah. peer reviews within a week. Mm, that's uh, good. You know, more than a thousand is not an exaggeration. I have difficulty it's, even getting the answer. You can't it, find reviewers from. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> they always say can't find reviewers for your article. Is, is yeah. that apocalyptic? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think that's apocalyptic yeah. peer review. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm grateful to people who made uh, sensible comments, uh, useful comments that improved the paper. The, the main conclusion does not change, but, but the methods were improved. We could look at lots of other issues that uh, people might be questioning about bias and, and see how robust the results would be to bias. We could use better statistical analysis. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, in a way, this is how science should work. You what, should yeah. have the manuscript as a preprint, and yeah. then you could have the entire scientific community commenting on that manuscript and then trying to improve it and then publish it in a peer-reviewed journal. So I, th I think that's, that's exactly how science should work. Was Santa Clara's study the best study or the study that had no flaws, that it was perfect? Of course not. It had flaws, it had shortcomings, it, it had unavoidably uh, some limitations like any study and even more so for a study where you try to do something as quickly as possible with very limited resources, with pure enthusiasm. We had more than 200 people volunteer their time. I volunteered my time 100%. All the key investigators volunteered their time completely free uh, to do something to get data on, on an important question as quickly as possible. If we had five years to design it, maybe we would have done it different. We were pushing NIH, we were pushing CDC, we were talking with uh, California State, uh, with uh, uh, all the players that had probably better ability to generate more complete and less biased studies. So we were pushing on all of these fronts and that didn't happen mm -hmm. as quickly as we wished, unfortunately. I mean, I guess it wouldn't, I mean, if we lived in a sensible country, I would imagine the CDC would say, we're going to pick 50 locations around the country, randomly select 10,000 people, and get zero prevalence data, and do that every month. And this is really the theme of your original March commentary. You were calling exactly. for random PCR, random zero prevalence, done at repeating intervals. And, and we did talk with CDC. We did talk with and NIH. What, they didn't we didn't want to we, do it? Well, <laughs> I think everybody wanted to do it. But, but there's always stumbling blocks, there's practical issues, there's, you know, getting the okay from higher-ups, there's... Uh, that even? Uh, we're, every day we're shut down, we're losing, what, 70 billion Goodness, dollars? I know, yeah. I know, uh, how but, does this make but now yeah. people are blaming us because we decided to do it for free uh -huh. with our volunteer time, with the best that we could, and with data that eventually turned out to be correct. Uh, we'll so back. I want to come back to yes. that. Okay, one I'm, more paragraph. I'm, I'm one more paragraph. Sorry. <laughs> one, one more paragraph to punish you. Uh, one more. <laughs> okay. It was late, the last paragraph. Then you about will COVID. go and fix that page <laughs> <laughs> at the instruction of the person. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I, th I think so somebody, who's listening might, somebody who's listening might fix the page. Oh, I, goodness. I, I'm, I'm kidding. But, but indeed, no, but, it's, but, it's, it's just so sad. Some, someday it will be different, I believe. Okay, the last paragraph. It was later reported that authors of the study received funding from JetBlue's founder, which. <laughs> <laughs> which led to criticism over a potential conflict of interest in a this is my favorite favorite sentence in a guest opinion article in Scientific American former colleagues of Unides this is Jeannie Lenzer and Shannon Brownlee they're they're not journalists they're of course former colleagues of you <laughs> wrote that a legal firm had determined he had no financial conflict okay so the money in question was and I've heard you talk about another podcast I won't belabor it it was a $5,000 payment from, I think, either JetBlue, the corporation, or the CEO of JetBlue to Stanford University in some anonymous donor account that was pooled and became part of the $50,000 that you all did to run your study. Um, I don't know what to say. The reason I think it's a troublesome conflict of interest is, um, I don't know, let's say, let's, let's imagine the worst case scenario. The JetBlue guy wants his airlines to run. He really wants them to Of fly. course. Of course. Yeah. He wants to make a lot of money. Yeah. And he says, look at all these people. They got the COVID. They're worried about COVID. We need a way to get them back in the airplane. So what we're going to do, we're going to give this guy $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's like, he looks at his bank, obviously, I mean, he must be a rich dude. I mean, he must have yes. a lot of money. But he's like, but how much is it worth it to him, just the 5000 uh -huh. And then let's give it in the pooled account. And, and then they'll fabricate the results, of course. Yes. And then with the fabricated results, no one will know that, that, that the fabricated results are fabricated. All the other estimates will be wildly divergent, but people will still trust the fabricated results, and they'll start flying. And I think it's ludicrous, because I think uh, this is an objection I have across the board to there's a narrative that people who dislike these restrictions are 
libertarians who want the free market to prevail. But I think the, the fallacy of the narrative is that um, um, if, if, if there are, in fact, if they severely underestimate the lethality of it and, and try to dupe people, that problem will go detected very quickly and people won't fly in the airplane. Um, you, you can't get people to fly in an airplane from one five thousand dollars in a study. Okay, that's my last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, th- that's uh, more ridiculous than than serious in a way because uh, obviously, I, I I can't believe that anyone would want to destroy their career for five thousand dollars divided not paid to themselves, not paid to themselves, and, <laughs> yeah. and divided by two hundred people working on the yeah, study. Because right. I, I was like the sixteenth author among yeah. seventeen authors. And then, then, but the but the the, the best part of the Wikipedia was that. Um, that the, the the defense of you was your colleagues. See, this is what really I I, I think it's really strange. Um, how many people have you co-authored with in your career? Uh, probably about ten thousand. That's right. Maybe more. Ten thousand, right? <laughs> yeah. You have a, yeah, ten thousand, maybe more. And we have co-authored, I think, maybe three papers, but between the years two thousand ten and I think the last one was twenty thirteen. Um, and we have no ongoing collaborations or co-authorship. Um, Co-author and I've co-authored with hundreds of people. Co-authoring with someone, that's not really make them your. Co- I mean, they're your colleague in the sense that we're all yeah. part of the same profession, yeah. or we're all in the business of science. But one co-authorship does not a colleague or friend make, and it can't because I don't even know half these co. I mean, no offense to these people I've co-authored with, I just don't know these people well. Yeah. Yes, this is uh, this is really weird. Because, yeah. Uh, indeed, uh, that that whole story about uh, the five thousand dollars. Uh, we were getting so much hate mail, uh, and uh, <laughs> we were uh, after the BuzzFeed story. Uh, my, not just myself, my family, my mother were were threatened, and I have narrated that story about the hoax uh, where people said that my mother had died and started calling at at her apartment asking for the funeral, and she had a hypertensive crisis, that she almost died from. Uh, so, I asked Stanford leadership to to say how can you protect us can you find out what happened yeah i'm not aware of any whistleblower uh complaint that has been sent is there such a thing uh has something happened that we were not aware of i mean how would i know for example if uh, that uh, airline uh, company owner uh, went to the lab and paid five thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> But so, wait, you, you, you only fly JetBlue, is that fair to say? I don't think I have ever flown JetBlue. <laughs> okay, anyway, let's put it aside for a second. But I, but, I, wanna, but yeah. I fly a lot, so you know, may, maybe let's, I have, who knows? Maybe you, you, you have, so, uh, so, that's another so, undisclosed. So both myself and, yeah. and uh, other people in the team, we, we wanted to, to get things straight. Is there a whistleblower yeah. complaint? And, until this moment, I haven't seen a whistleblower complaint. But in order to do that properly... Uh, Stanford did get an outside law firm to try to do a fact finding. You know, fact finding mm-hmm. is not that you're accused; it's not an investigation that you have done something wrong. But you're trying to find what's going on here. Yeah. Why are faculty attacked? Their lives are threatened. Their family is threatened. Uh, the, the whole reputation is is blown to pieces. Uh, what's going on here? Yeah. And you know, the conclusion was that there was absolutely no conflict of interest, uh, and there was no influence in the design, uh, contact, analysis, or presentation of the results. Yeah. Uh, apparently, that 5,000 do- donation had been made anonymously to Stanford University along with the $27 billion of endowment uh-huh. uh, after the paper had been submitted. Uh-huh, uh, so so it, it was completely... Is that true, after cra- it submitted? That's my understanding. Okay. Uh, so so it's, it's completely crazy, uh, but nevertheless, I thought that it was very important. Uh, apparently, not only... Uh, these two uh, journalists, uh, Lenzer and uh, and Brownlee, but but also Washington Post got hold of of that information. Oh, and they that's have, right. Peter they have, Jameson. Yeah, in his Peter article. Jameson. Yeah, and he has also stated the same thing that uh, there was no influence of any funder on the design, contact, analysis, or dissemination of the work. But of course, after you have BuzzFeed come up with that story. There's a strong feeling that there's a conflict of interest and sure. perception in the public mind and your reputation goes to trash. Sure. And, but your, and so does your Wikipedia page. <laughs> so does your Wikipedia page. <laughs> so, so does your Wikipedia page. Well, you can't take it too seriously. Okay, now here, here's what I want to drill down on. Um, okay, I, I say that because I think, um, 
I think your critics, um, I think they've gone too far in a couple ways. I mean, I think, I, I don't I don't know why it's happening. I mean, I, I do know why. It's a pandemic, and when there's pandemic, um, reason takes the backseat to emotion often. And, and who can I curse for the pandemic? I mean, I'm, I'm frustrated like a lot of people. I, I'm annoyed. But who do I curse? And there's no one to really curse. I mean, I can curse Trump. I have his little statue. I stab him. You know, <laughs> his little figurette. I, voodoo. Yeah, voodoo. I, I can do that. Um, you know, and then I can curse you and I can curse some others. Um, and I think to some degree it's some of that. It's just a natural human thing. Um, okay, but the, but the one thing I want to drill down on is the flu comparisons. Um, you know, I think um, many many people um, they they do not like comparing SARS-CoV-2 to seasonal influenza, although there have been some strains of seasonal influenza with IFRs that are um, not trivial. You know, real r- like fifty-seven, fifty-eight. Um, uh, of course, nineteen eighteen, which is probably the most devastating yeah. uh, pandemic yeah. illness. Um, but when we make a comparison between SARS-CoV-2 to other viruses such as flu, I think there's two parts to the comparison. One is if you get infected, what is the probability you will die or suffer long-term malady or sequela or what's the probability you can get really sick? That's one part. The second part is um, um, what percent of people are susceptible to being infected. Yeah. And I think seasonal influenza, um, the, we all have some uh, cross immunity with prior seasonal influenza. And so the fraction of people susceptible so I guess my, my question to you is, um, you know, you, you utilize sometimes this comparison of how should we think about this in terms of a risk we face, a contagious in disease risk. Um, do you feel like it was, is it an, a wrong comparison? Is it an apt comparison? How do you think of these two domains, the fraction of people susceptible and the IFR if you were to get it? I think that that's the best way that you can approach it. Uh, the whole comparison against flu, unfortunately, has been so misused by people who had political uh, reasons to misuse it uh, on, on both sides of, of the spectrum. And you had all these epic battles fought around that paradigm that, I- in a way, I feel that, that it, it has been dismantled uh, so badly that, that I'm not sure that it's useful any longer. I, but I, I actually don't use it. I use a yeah. suicide comparison. I can't well, even... I, I, any, I, any comparison I use is, is going to be very difficult. Okay. Uh, but but if, if we want to stick to that comparison, okay. um, typical influenza, if, if you take 7.7 billion people who live in this planet, uh, and if, if I were a, a Nazi torturer... Uh, and getting all of them to be infected with either a seasonal influenza strain or with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, of course, I'm not a Nazi no, torturer. No, of course, of course. <laughs> That's the one thing that has not been said. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, not yet. Now it'll be quoted uh, from the but, interview. But yet. here comes the torturer and says, uh, you have to be infected. Yes, yes. Uh, choose your virus. Uh-huh. Uh, I would say the majority would have to choose... Uh, to be infected with SARS-CoV-2 because of the 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 IFR by age exactly okay okay so because so, most people are young yeah uh, but it, so so yeah. they would have to pick SARS-CoV-2 uh, but but some uh, who would pick influenza the most elderly and those who have uh, severe underlying diseases the differential would be really stark so you mean the IFR is much greater for yes. okay. it, it would be Sounds amazingly cool. higher yes. so clearly they would have a very strong choice you know for the, for the younger it would be low risk either way although well influenza is not really that low risk especially in little children I mean, you can have uh, something like 30 to 100,000 children less than 5 years old dying every year from influenza now what about the challenge with you know are we comparing apples and apples because with SARS-CoV-2 we're using IFR based on antibodies in the blood with influenza yeah. do we ha- has there ever been a zero you know are we using antibodies in the it, blood or are we using it's not an easy comparison yeah. also for that reason okay. because we don't have this type of detailed information and tracking that we have for SARS-CoV-2 so it, there's a little bit of speculation here but if you think about the numbers a typical flu year is about half a million deaths so we have two years now uh, two years would be a, a million, mm-hmm. and we have a bit over two million deaths with uh, SARS-CoV-2 over these two years, two, two seasons in, in a sense. Uh, so uh, you can have that if you have twice the infection fatality rate or 2.5 times infection fatality rate or two 2.5 times the spread of the virus. 
And this is a new virus, as you say, to which we have probably very little or no other immune memory. And it's more likely that it will spread more compared to typical influenza. Sure. You can ha not have both. <laughs> I mean, you, you cannot have a virus that you say is 10 times more lethal than influenza and 10 times more rapidly spreading, more widely spreading than influenza. Th 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 then you would expect to have 100 million deaths. Okay, okay, sure. and, and this is apocalypse. And this is the apocalypse that I was afraid of back in February and early March and why I was arguing that we should shut down everything immediately I see. back then. Uh -huh. But it's not 100 million. At least with the virus that we know now, I don't know if we have a new strain that evolves at some point, but not with the virus that we have now. Then I guess my question to you is, maybe not on this influenza point, but broadly, you know, if you were to go back to yourself March 14th <laughs> and advise yourself, you know, would you have done anything different in March and April? Would you have said anything different? Would you have written anything different? Would you have spoken differently? I don't know, to be honest, because I cannot randomize myself uh, to have two Johnny Anidis back in uh, early March. Um, one option would have been not to say anything. That's right. And I think that that was That's a popular the solution a lot of that most people chose. Yeah. I, I know some amazing scientists uh, who have chosen that path and who have communicated with me to say how much they agree with what I do and what I say, but they say that they cannot speak. And, and I, I think that that's the worst uh, consequence of, of everything that has happened. That, you know, these, these top scientists, they're afraid to talk. If they are afraid to talk, then who can talk? I think no one. And uh, therefore, I cannot really justify an alternative where I would have been silent. Uh, say something different? Well, that's, that's what I thought. That's what I knew or actually that's what I didn't know and I said that I didn't know so uh, I, I, I don't think so I, I, I think that uh, I, I feel that I did what I had to do I, and I, I felt like an obligation to tell the truth and the truth was I don't know we're facing a major crisis and I don't know gentlemen you don't know can we please do something urgently, mm -hmm. collecting data that will get us to a position to do something more cogently rather than blindly? I wonder if the now I, I wonder if one of the reasons why the flu comparison rubs people the wrong way is that the person in the community hearing it, they 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 internalize it differently because they confuse the two things in their mind, which is the IFR. If were you to be infected, the probability of death and the probability of infection. But those were always distinct things because the probability of infection was obviously, um, not probability, the percent of people who could be infected was always different with SARS-CoV-2. It was always higher. Yeah. Or I guess, I don't know, to be honest, maybe we didn't even know that fully in the beginning, mm -hmm. right? We re I mean, I don't think we really knew that fully. And maybe we still don't know that fully to the, this moment, um, despite all the T-cell stuff, you know, there's a whole genre of literature. Um, and then the second thing is the probability of death were you to get the virus. Um, and and any time the comparison is used, people naturally internal rub bundle those two things together. It, it is very hard to separate them, but but you need to take them both into account, because uh, based on what we see now, you cannot have both. You cannot have both a virus that is amazingly lethal and amazingly spreading. Yeah. Uh, you can have modestly lethal and modestly spreading. You can have not so lethal and amazingly spreading uh, and also the lethal component varies depending on the population tremendously because we have these these geometrically exponentially uh, different uh, risk across the age spectrum and across uh, comorbidities uh, that that creates uh, gradients of a thousand fold different risk i think i calculated seven thousand five hundred fold different risk between 85 and 10 years old yeah i, th I think you're about right so yeah. so th this is this is a risk that for epidemiologists it's uh 
like the holy grail of epidemiology. In epidemiology, we're fighting our entire life with risk ratios of three, if we're very lucky. If we're lucky. And, I, and I with risk ratios <laughs> of 1.003, yeah. yeah, you know, in, yeah. in genetics, if yeah. we're not lucky. So in, in most of that modern epidemiology that has been run over by precision medicine and precision health, yeah. what do we say? That we will be able to make risk gratification. With what kind of risk ratios or odds ratios, 1.03. And, and we were confident that we can stratify based on 1.03s. And now we have 7,540 and, and we're questioning whether we can stratify. Yeah. That, that's, that's completely amazing. If, if precision medicine, I would not call it precision medicine, I would call it bulk risk medicine, yeah. cannot do it, then medicine should just quit. You know, we cannot do anything. If we, if we cannot do something for for risk ratios of 7,000, then uh, we should be out of business. I wonder if you have been uh, silent yourself uh, recently, and I'll tell you one issue that I want to pick your brain on. Yeah. School closure. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I recognize that there are a range of policy views that have been articulated now from, you know, um, reopening large chunks of the economy for people of, uh, and, and trying to shield the, the elderly. We'll talk about your shielding paper, I think. Um, but one thing that I think, you know, if you were to s smell equipoise, smell the populations like people really are torn about is school closure, particularly elementary and middle school kids. Um, European nations have tried a, a wide variety of different strategies. Um, this is a topic that I'm happy to weigh in on. I, I've weighed in on in a couple op-eds recently that they got to open up these schools. It makes no sense to me. Um, when you balance the risk to the child, which is, um, you know, very low. The IFR is very low in kids. And actually, one more thing I want to say about IFR. We, we point out. There needs to be two IFRs. IFR pre-August and post-August. Because in August, they stopped doing all this crazy, this crazy medicine that may have distorted the IFR. Um, and in fact, we see that. I mean, there is data from a number of hospitals showing that the, the CFR has declined precipitously between first and second wave. Um, which could be due to biological factors from the people who were infected or also um, quote-unquote cowboy medicine. Anyway, we'll come, but I want yeah. to come back to the schools. Yeah. The schools issue, you know, it's a complex trade-off. There's risks to teachers, plus or minus school. I've looked at the data, and I think we're talking about odds ratio 1.3-ish. I mean, that the, the likelihood of a teacher getting infected versus another person in the community um, in places with open schools. I think modest. I mean, and some studies show no increased risk for teachers because maybe the kids aren't spreading it to teachers as much. Um, kids are about half as likely to get infected as adults in contact tracing studies. Um, and then the harms to children from closing schools is harms you can't really even capture. We don't know. We have three million kids in this country. There's no external contact outside of the family since March. Uh, are they being abused physically, mentally? Are they falling behind in grades? Um, this is going to haunt them for their, you know, there'll be a, 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 a there'll be a there'll be a, 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 a fraction of people who never go to college because of this. There'll be a fraction of people who are more likely to be teen pregnant, um, who may be more likely to be involved in, in guns. Um, so I'm curious what you think, and if you think you've been quiet on it. I haven't heard you talk about schools. school closure is is a horrible idea, and uh, I I think that. Uh, it's it's amazingly counterproductive. It's amazingly unhealthy. It's amazingly devastating to continue with school closures. Uh, I'm fully convinced about that. I think that the data are extremely strong, uh, as you just mentioned, both in terms of risk to the children and in terms of all the consequences. There's a very large number of good papers with some uh, really staggering estimates of harm, uh, including the one by uh, Dmitry Christakis. Oh, boy. Uh, That's going to uh, get another... Uh, which, which, but, but there's some criticism. Of course, of, okay, of okay, course. Okay. And, and yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, if I put on my meta-research yes, hat, I would yes. say probably his estimate is exaggerated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. Okay. But, but, but at the same time, you know, even if it's exaggerated, it, it's uh, so astronomically high that uh, you have to take it seriously, even if it's uh, one-tenth of that or even if it's uh, one-hundredth of that. Mm -hmm. uh, you have practically no benefit in terms of uh, stopping the spread of the pandemic or very questionable benefit. Uh, you have no or very, very little risk to to the children, uh, maybe actually less risk to the children because they may be 
just as easily infected if they don't go to school. I mean, That's a question. Doing something. So there's and one nice, you know, um, there's a nice natural experiment in Germany where they have the staggered summer holidays, and this is an Edinburgh paper, this is an economics paper. Some of these econo economic analyses, they do, a, they do a better job of causality, I think, than some of these medical analyses and these kinds they, of... They are, yeah. they are. But, but I, I have to, to acknowledge that, that all of these analyses, they have limitations. Uh, so you have to take them with a grain of salt, uh, and you have to acknowledge that the error rate is more substantial than the presented confidence intervals. And uh, then you have to look at the big picture. So the big picture includes all the other harms, all the other considerations. Mm -hmm. And even if you have uncertainty and a larger error margin on the exact effect on pandemic spread, for example, yeah. uh, that error, even if at its worst, is not enough to really counterbalance all the other harms, all the other horrible things that, that can happen when we're closing our schools. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of keeping schools open. Uh, have I not talked enough? Well, have I not heard enough <laughs> in terms of vandalism and, and um, uh, people saying that uh, I'm crazy or whatever? I, I, I just... People say that I gave too many interviews. The, the, the truth is that I avoid interviews in principle, with mm -hmm. few exceptions, uh, when I feel that I have time to expand in more detail and in, in more granularity and with more caveats what, uh, what might be going on and what my perception of the evidence might be. I try to work on science. I try to publish papers, peer-reviewed papers. This mm -hmm. is what I have been doing all along. And I, I, I cannot really be there to to talk to all the news media who want me or do not want me mm -hmm. uh, and I realize that some media probably do not want me but that's fine <laughs> but you could you could write an op-ed on schools you have not I think it's because of I guess I'll say that um, the the vandalism has affected you it well, has affected me yeah and uh, Whether you're, uh, yeah. now you're making me go into a self-reflective mode have I silenced myself okay let's do a little bit of psychoanalysis on the spot um, you had to have I mean yes, no one can yes. take that level so, of so, criticism so, without so, doing so something different yeah writing an op-ed yeah um, yes I'm, I'm a bit more reluctant to write op-eds yeah. because I saw that op-eds really give ammunition to people to say uh, the most horrible things while at least <coughs> publishing a scientific paper in a peer-reviewed journal uh, you will still get attacked but at least this is an area where I feel a bit more comfortable saying I know these weapons yeah. I, I, can, I can handle the attacks better when it's an op-ed anyone can say anything yeah. nowadays it, it, it's just it, it's amazing what nonsense is circulating in op-eds e even in the best venues and I'm not saying that people should stop writing op-eds right. because that, that would go along the path of the, the censorship and the silencing that we have been discussing. But, but people should take a step back and ask, um, well, this is an opinion. Let's take it as an opinion. Let's tolerate it. Let's give it some value. Let's give it some credit. Don't tear it to pieces. Challenge it. Destroy it with arguments. But don't attack the person. Don't go into ad hominem mode. I, I think in the current environment, it's almost impossible to have that happen. I think it's, it's very difficult. And I would say there's one more thing that challenges it is that um, people have learned a word called misinformation. And I don't know if they know what it means because um, I've written some op-eds and, um, and here's what they do. And, and mine is not the same scale as yours. I mean, I'm talking about some very, very narrow thing um, that anger some people but I don't think it's angered as many people I haven't I haven't angered as many people and I'm not as I'm not as prominent to be angered by um, but my op-ed was basically you know I, I received my vaccination I'm a healthcare worker so it's no surprise and um, my op-ed was basically I hear the narrative that after vaccination quote nothing changes you're supposed to social distance and isolate and it strikes me as a bit implausible for a few ways one mm -hmm. if you look at the mm -hmm. vaccine data and yeah. there's you know it's a quite effective vaccine um, so my op-ed, the gist of it was, if you got two doses of vaccine, you go 14 days asymptomatic, um, you can you can 
get some concession in life. You can go hug your mother. You can go have a dinner party with people who are vaccinated, which, by the way, every doctor I know is doing, right? So it's every single person I know is doing yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and I got a lot of pushback. And it was similar. I mean, not similar in magnitude, but similar in tone to what you got. Um, of course, I'm a shitty person. That's, I mean, <laughs> I am a shitty person, but they don't know that. You know, John, they, they don't know that. That's what really gets me. They, had, they, had, uh, they don't know why I'm a bad person, but, but, but they say that. Um, they say I'm pro-death. <laughs> you know, like, like my goal is to people die. Um, they say um, my favorite is uh, I'm, I'm an attention seeker. I'm like, oh, what, 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 what? I'm like, if I wanted attention, wouldn't it want positive attention? They want this, like yeah, somebody crap yeah. on my doorstep. And then they said, um, but here's what really gets me: when they talk about it, they screenshot a part of it, but they will not provide a link to the op-ed. And and that is because they say. If you link to something that is misinformation or disinformation, you propagate disinformation. <laughs> but the flip side is you don't allow the audience to use their own brain. You don't give them the benefit. Um, I feel it's really anti-intellectual. It's anti-intellectual to condemn. And there have been some academics, prominent academics, who say, I read a paper I don't like. I will not link to it. So you cannot read it. Just know yeah. that it's bad. Yeah. That's not right. I mean, that's the road to hell. If you... Even if it's loathsome, you got to link to it so that everybody can read it and decide if it's loathsome. I, I fully agree. You, you need to give credit to people who disagree with you. And I, I always believe that you need to do your best to understand the arguments of your opponents and actually find a way to strengthen them, you know, present them in the strongest possible light. Instead of creating strawmen out of them, mm -hmm. try to say, see, so what is Vinay saying here? I disagree with him, but can I put his argument in the best, strongest possible light? And then, if I can do that, then try to say something to uh, counter yes. that argument. Now, this, this doesn't happen. And you get this social media mob that uh, you say you have many people who hate you. We just don't know how many these people are. That's true. To, to, to be honest, I, I think that they're probably 0.01%. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay? But they're the loudest. But if, if you have even three people yes. shouting, it sounds as if they're a million. Yeah. And many of them have not even the courage of putting their name yes, forth. I, they use pseudonyms, I some, some them, very yeah. weird uh, pseudonyms as if they're Pokemons or, <laughs> or whatever. And uh -huh. I, I, I think that I don't want to silence these people. I, I, I like them to be able to show how foolish they are uh, because they, they give a perspective of what the problem is that we're facing with information. They are the misinformation. I know, that's what I think, And yes. I, I don't want to, to silence that problem. I want us to be able to see the magnitude of misinformation and hate and aggressiveness and uh, ridiculous efforts to subvert people who want to think. Because unless we see it, we will not be able to, to take care of it. And take care of it would be just to let them say whatever they say and have 99.9% .9 of people understand that they're jerks. Well, I, <laughs> I, I worry that what's happening is they say what they want to say and 70% of people see them for what they are, but they won't say a damn word because they're scared because they're going to be the next one. Yeah, they, they, they will not, and, and I, I think that uh, that's fine because you don't want people to be entrenched into a debate of this sort. This is a debate that leads nowhere. Yes, right, uh, you know, right. ad hominem attacks uh, or attacks that do not allow your opponent's view to be shown, and you just say that uh, this is Stalin or this is, uh, uh, you know, pro-death, as you say. Yes, I'm pro-death. Uh, yes, it, that's, it's, uh, th that's, you know... It, it's fair that 99% of people do not want to engage in this type of, yes. of controversy and debate. They want to stay out of it. And uh, I, I, I think that perhaps the key driver of this animosity is, is the pandemic and the response to it that yeah. creates lots of very angry people. And I, I want to sympathize with, with many of them because I, I can... I can see that if someone is afraid that they're going to die or their friends are going to die or their family or their parents or they have that sense of imminent danger, yeah. uh, you they, need yeah, exactly. they, they, they need to ventilate. They need to find someone to ventilate. Yeah. And if they see something that they disagree with, they will fight against it. It's, it's, it's very human. It's very natural. 
and I, I think that I can see it happen to myself as well. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to restrain myself to the extent possible not to enter into these discussions because they, 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 they just lead nowhere. Yeah, somebody, I, somebody said something really mean about me and I was like, who is this person? Why are they so, it's so hostile, so hostile? And then I looked on their little pictures and then there's a picture of them showing that the mask they routinely wear and it was like a World War One gas mask. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay, I get, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. I get why you're a little, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, if that's where you are emotionally, yeah, I see it. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely right then yeah. to, to say what they say. Yeah. But 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 wait. Let me ask you a different. Yes. I mean, uh, we could talk about this all day. I want to ask you, COVID zero. I mean, uh, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I think they're one of the things people believe we're going to get to. At least some people, vocal people, some smart people, is that we're going to get to a world where there is no COVID, zero COVID. We're going to get there by vaccinating everybody, as many people as will do it. We know in America we have some difficulties. The vaccine, I think, is amazing. I mean, we can talk about that. It's an amazing, you know, development. Um, once we vaccinate everybody, I worry there will still be COVID outbreaks. I mean, this vaccine, as great as it is, it's not perfect. And especially if you're older and your immune system's impaired, there'll be COVID outbreaks. It may be seasonal. It may come every winter, a few COVID outbreaks. SARS-CoV-2, my feeling is it'll become endemic. What do you, um, but their feeling is that you can test trace isolate. You can contact trace. You can drive this to extinction. We can be rid of it like smallpox. Uh, what are your thoughts? What is the, the long-term game? The, the long-term game depends equally upon the virus and upon us. So we can do our best. We, we can continue using measures that are not too disruptive, but they may help, like you know, some social distancing, masks when we cannot uh, avoid congestions or congested circumstances. Of course, vaccinate, uh, especially the people who are vulnerable, have a top priority and you know, personnel in, in hospitals. So we, we can do our part. Uh, we just don't know what the virus will do. And uh, the, the virus is likely to change. I, I don't know in which direction we already see that it's changing. So saying that you necessarily need to get to zero COVID is, is a little bit like saying that I will not tolerate uh, anyone dying from cancer yeah. from now on. I see. And, uh, and we wish for that, but of course yes, the reality is yes. it can't happen. We, we, happen. Of course we wish for that, but... but uh, I, I think it's 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 very difficult to to believe that this will happen. Uh, it's a bit like saying that uh, we'll have no one dying from influenza. We will have no one dying from viruses in general. We will have no one dying from tuberculosis. I think it's 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 a serious condition, and every effort that we can put towards ameliorating it, if not eradicating it, is useful. But eradication is. Uh, is a very high bar. It's a very high bar, and we have been successful with smallpox, but, but there's, I believe, 11,000 diseases uh, in the classification of diseases, and I cannot think of a second example <laughs> where, where we have eradicated yeah. something. And I mean, it has to do with some viral properties, the, the incubation period, the asymptomatic period, the, prop the ability to spread. Um, but let me ask you this. Some nations have done better than other nations. Vietnam, Cambodia, New Zealand, Australia, Taiwan, Singapore. Um, I guess, one, do you, do you agree that some nations have done better than other nations? When I think about why nations do differently than other nations, I put like four different factors. So one is um, um, there are some biological differences that we don't fully appreciate. The second difference is people have made different choices and those choices have yielded different outcomes. I mean, that's why the fate of nations are different. The third reason is stoichasticity or randomness. Um, um, and maybe the fourth reason is, um, I don't know, maybe fits in with the first reason, like geographic differences and population density differences and things like this. Um, Nobody has a parsimonious explanation that explains why every name. And oh, the fourth difference, uh, the fifth difference is, of course, we're not even measuring the things to the same. Yeah. The, the, the ascertainment is absolutely different. The differences in testing, differences in diagnostic criteria, differences in collecting the data. Um, the data is all, uh, some places, maybe entirely unreliable. When you look at this challenge where every amateur doctor, every amateur epidemiologist wants to explain why did some nations do better than others, how do you think about it? Are there any parsimonious stories you see? Ah, welcome to the drama of epidemiology. <laughs> uh, there's zillions of differences, as you say. And if, if we go back to look at previous pandemics, even though our data are even worse compared to the data that we have now, 
there were huge differences across different countries. Some countries were devastated. Some countries did very well. Uh, some locations within countries that they, they saw the apocalypse, using the same term again. I like it. It's a Greek word. <laughs> and uh, and some others were pretty spared. Uh, so it's it's clearly multifactorial. It's clearly also dependent on features of the virus that we do not understand uh, in sufficient detail. There, there's there's a chaotic component, I, I would argue. There's some stochastic component, but there's also a chaotic component. And, what, and what's the difference between chaos and stochasticity? So, so chaos, uh, it, you know, it's unpredictable. A you know, very tiny uh, difference in the initial conditions may lead you to a complete disaster or, or doing pretty well. Hmm? Uh, as opposed to just having some random error. Yeah. And you, you, you still get some reasonable prediction that based on, on these parameters you end up having 10% of the population or 60% of the population being infected. So one possibility is seeding events. So the yes. United States had many seeding events in the months of January, the February. The US is and not New Zealand. New Zealand mm. is in the middle of nowhere. It has one airport <laughs> and uh, they closed down the border. So mm. unless I swim from California to New Zealand, I'm not going to be there. <laughs> So, so uh, one potential explanation for Australia and New Zealand is fewer seeding events. Indeed. It's, it's very likely that, that this, the seeding load was very different. But, but even with the same seeding load, you can still have a chaotic evolution in, in that for, for the same number of infections, the circumstances may be such that the chain may be broken very early on. Now, this doesn't mean that you should not do the right things. Uh, I have argued from the very beginning since February that we need intensive testing. I was arguing for very intensive testing. And I think that New Zealand, of course, is in the middle of nowhere, but they also did intensive testing and contact tracing and isolation very early on. Australia did the same thing. Singapore, that had far more seating, and they, they're also a small country, but they're far more popular in terms of the visit that they get. Um, they did that. Uh, South Korea, that had a much higher seeding load, they did very aggressive intensive testing. So there are things that you can do. So test, trace, isolate. You, early on. Early on, your supporter, yes. as long as it's doable, once it gets to 20% of the population, it's every, right. Well, once it's 20% of the population, I would still argue uh, test okay. aggressively. I realize that tracking contacts at this point becomes, you know, everyone has been in co contact with everyone. But aggressive testing is something that I do believe. Uh, and, and I think that... Many people disagree with me. They may be right. I, I don't expect that aggressive testing will solve all the problem. But in principle, having eyes on the virus and, and where it is and where it spreads uh, might help you. Now, it, it, it's also an issue of whether you can do something with that testing. For example, if you aggressively test, but you give the results like one week later. Yeah, it's useless. That, that's useless. Or if you aggressively test, let's say you can do that in India, which cannot aggressively test, of course, but let's say that they could do it and you tell someone they're infected and they're living with 20 other people in a, in a small place of, of uh, <laughs> yeah. one room right. or two rooms. They can't isolate. They cannot isolate. So, so the, the ability to halt the spread based on aggressive testing would vary from one location to another. Mm. Um, for affluent societies, I think it can be pretty effective. For wealthy countries, but for disadvantaged populations, unfortunately, it's not enough. I see. Because you need to do more for these people. If they're homeless, they, you need to find some place for them where they can uh, really help themselves and help others. So, so uh, the, the pandemic has shown us that Western countries are among the poorest in the world. And unfortunately, we have some of the poorest people within and, these countries. Within these countries, yeah. and it's and, worse. It's yeah. worse to be poor in a wealthy country compared to be poor in a poor country. Hmm. And I think, I mean, the reality of we. Uh, uh, well, anyway, we'll talk about lockdowns. But I, okay, well, uh, maybe I'll shift into that. So. Um, you know, I read your recent paper with Iran Ben David, and I've also read, you know, there's a paper in science and there's a paper in nature, uh, uh, behavioral, I forget which, one of the nature journals. There are many, and there are going to be many papers. I mean, yeah. you're a meta researcher, you know, there's, there's 10,000 papers coming, and they're all going to look at lockdown, quote unquote, whatever lockdown means, which is essential business closures, um, travel restrictions, um, things like that, um, or stay at home orders. Um, and I think you, we already, I already see it coming. Um, there's, a, there's potential, you know, 
uh, 1,000 different definitions of what a lockdown is. Um, there's many, many data sets. Uh, people are going to look at this in many, many ways. Um, very likely, you're going to get every estimate you want to get. You're going to get lockdowns. Don't do anything. Lockdowns do anything. And then the other thorny questions is, um, you know, there may be true effect modifiers, like a lockdown may help, like in Perth, when there's one case, you know, there's 12 cases, you lock down the whole city, you go from 12 to zero, maybe it does something. Maybe if the case rate is one in 1,000, the case rate is one in 10,000, one in 100, maybe it's a different ball game, like North Carolina. Maybe then it doesn't, you know, I, I don't know the answer to these questions. Um, maybe lockdown is different than aspirin. If I give you aspirin on Monday and I give you aspirin a year from now, the biochemical effect is the same. If I lock you down in January and lock you down in November, you don't want to lock down in November. You're tired. Yeah. You're sick of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my question is, one is just, I mean, your paper, I think, um, was one, one way to look at the question. And it, and it concludes that there was no effect. Um, but I guess I wonder if you think... Um, Will there ever be a scientific consensus or will we just always, we will always believe what we want to believe. The people who believe it helped will believe it helped. The people who are question it will question it. I think it's going to be difficult to move away from uh, entrenched positions. People who have strong beliefs, they will continue to have strong beliefs. Uh, personally, it may sound weird, but uh, I would be interested to find whatever result came out of that paper. I, I didn't have like a preference to, to show that lockdown works or does not work. I, I just wanted to get the best possible estimate about its effectiveness and some estimate of its uncertainty. But there are so many decision points and so many different ways to attack this type of data that are not just observational data. There are observational data in a, a multi-confounded, multi-correlated, unsteady background situation, which is like a nightmare compared to observational epidemiology in general, yeah. which is already a huge nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so so the, the best that you can do is try to be systematic, yeah. try to be thorough, uh, try to be consistent. So this is what we did in that paper, and try to report everything, just all the analysis that you did and all the results that you got, and then try to get an estimate. I'm, I'm worried that lots of that literature is just textbook cases of selective reporting. For example, the Imperial College paper in Nature, you know, Flaxman et al., uh, amazing team, extremely competent, but that's a problem. They're extremely competent, mm -hmm. which means that they can run a lot of analysis. Mm -hmm. So they published the paper in Nature with one model that shows that lockdown, draconian lockdown, was what really saved lives. Three million people in Europe in the first wave saved. And then you see that they have created another model that they applied not in, in Europe, but in the US. And then you say, well, let's try to apply their US model to Europe. And that model shows that lockdown does not work and at all. You, you, you did this, but you, you have not published. I haven't seen this paper. So it's, it's in peer review. Okay. I hope it, it will be accepted soon. Okay. And um, we have it as a preprint at the moment. Okay. But th th that, that to me suggests these models were available at the same time. Yes. Actually, the second model that showed that lockdown had practically no benefit has a much better fit to the data okay. compared to the one that was published in Nature. It suggests they tried both and they picked the one they liked. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Okay. And, well. and then they had additional countries in Europe that data were available where even their model one did not show a benefit and they didn't, didn't publish those. So, so what am I to think? In, uh, in these circumstances. My, my, my interpretation, you have the most competent people in the world just succ succumbing to their competence. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess my ch um, the question I see is, I just don't see how any consensus will ever come. I mean, you can lag this data. H yes. How many days does it take a long time to work? Seven days, five days, three four days, days three two days, hours, two days, uh, two hours. Yeah, of course. You can, and I mean, that's just one of uh, 10,000 analytic choices. 10,000 analytic choices people with strong opinions, strong emotion, you'll never get the I, truth. I agree. But um, I think that this is what's going to happen. You will have a very divergent literature and very strong opinions and very strong beliefs. But when you look at the totality of that literature and all the uncertainties around even the favorable estimates and you compare it against the certainty of the harms, then it becomes an irrelevant question. You know, if, if you can decrease case counts by 30%, which our study suggests that probably you cannot do that, but let's say that you can do that, and you have all these other harms accumulating on health, society, economy, uh, the world at large, 
I wouldn't care about a 30% decrease, even if it were there, which doesn't seem to be there. I mean, it, it's more likely there's a 30% increase, actually, <laughs> based on our analysis. But but even if there is that 30%, the, the, the risk-benefit ratio becomes completely unlikely to be favorable. But I guess one of the things the lockdown proponents will argue back is that the harms were, that, was inev- that die was cast. They were inevitable. The harms were going to come. And um, because um, if you had a, a, a runaway uh, epidemic, uh, these health services are going to be disrupted and all these things are going to accrue anyway. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, I, I think that that's uh, uh, probably a straw argument. Okay. I think it's uh, it's hard to be compatible with, uh, with the data. You will have some consequences out of an unchecked uh, pandemic. There's no doubt about it. And I, I have never argued in favor of having the pandemic unchecked. The, the question is, can you really check it with these measures? And even the most optimistic estimates suggest that you cannot. And, and even in these countries, even if you take Model 1 by Imperial, the Nature paper, the 3 million lives, and you see what happened in the second wave. It just came back. It, and, it, and, it, it just d- 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 delayed it a few months, destroyed health, economy, society, everything, and it just came back and it came back with a vengeance. And why is it that lockdowns don't work? Is it because that the people in the essential work who are the victims of spread are going to be doing that essential work anyway, like line cooks? Is it that people are having gatherings at home? I mean, what is the mechanistic reason why it wouldn't work? I I, I think that lockdown in real life is a very complex social phenomenon. Uh, It's not that people freeze in place. If if we were all robots and we could turn off a switch and uh, wake up three months later or even three weeks, then the pandemic would be gone. But the reality is that a very large segment of the population still have to work. They're essential workers. They work under conditions, actually, that they're disadvantaged. They're more exposed. Uh, and uh, also, the locations that we should be protecting more, we're not protecting them. So lockdown itself does nothing for nursing homes. If, if anything, it allows all these poor, sal- low-salary workers who are staff in nursing homes to float from one nursing home to another and, That's in fact, massively... Yeah nursing home residents, and then you get 50% of the deaths in nursing home residents. Lockdown makes things worse for those who are most vulnerable. And in that recent paper in BMJ uh, Global Health, that's exactly what I tried to dissect. And, And the data suggests that that's the case. Under conditions of lockdown, most countries had inverse protection. They protected those that didn't need to be protected, and they let those who had to be protected completely unprotected being more massively infected than the general population. Let me ask you about this. Um, um, I guess one question is, if you were in charge of the policy, what would the policy be? What would what tools would you employ? You would have gone into nursing homes and you would have uh, separated residents and had testing, universal testing in nursing yes, homes. Yes, v- very draconian measures in, in, in nursing, nursing homes. Okay. And so then, repeated testing, uh, draconian hygiene. Okay. We have realized that nursing homes are mostly private enterprises. They're They're abandoned yes, very I often know. you know the quality of care is horrible yeah. in, in a way we have just thrown these people away yeah for and, decades and, for and, decades yeah. and it's just happening now but it actually it has been happening for decades so we need to fix that and if we fix that as i said in in western countries this has been 40 50 60 percent of deaths yes uh, so which leads the question ifr outside of people dwelling in yeah, nursing homes it's okay. half it's half, okay. Okay, so you, you know, once you go to, to community dwelling, you need to decrease it by two because 50% of the deaths are mm-hmm. in these facilities. I see. So uh, IFR in an 80-year-old in, the, in, the, in an institutional, in a, in a nursing home? 25%. And then in the community, 12.5%? Oh, in the community, an 80-year-old 80, 80 yeah. community dwelling. Uh, much lower. Oh, really? Actually, we do an international meta-analysis. We try to get data from around the world I on see. this. You and, also need uh, to parse it between before June and after June or something like that. Uh, yes, uh, there there is probably a cohort effect, and there is an effect of, of what we did uh, mostly wrong. <laughs> That's what I <laughs> in the first about, wave. Yeah, we have a paper coming out in uh, Nature Communications, which is an international meta analysis of uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine trials. Uh, we show a significant increase in mortality, mm, which may so, so you know probably we killed about a hundred thousand people just with hydroxychloroquine, with hydroxychloroquine globally as treatment globally. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, not knowing how to use mechanical ventilation, 
uh, yes. just, just just going crazy yeah. and early intubating and, people yeah. who too early did not have to be intubated. So so probably we lost a lot of lives. Yeah, uh, but in, that'll affect the IFR estimates from that time. That will probably get the IFR estimates lower in later periods compared to earlier periods. Uh, I don't know how big the effect might be. Um, my estimate is that currently, globally, as we speak, you know, early February, global IFR is likely to be about 0.12 to 0.15 percent. You know, if, if you estimate that at least 1.5 billion, maybe up to 2 billion people uh, have been infected. Uh, and that's what you think the number is right now? Well, I, I think that's what it is because... India in November had 60% seroprevalence. You know, that alone gives you <laughs> a huge contribution. You're halfway there. And, uh, you know, many other countries, uh, uh, Latin America seroprevalence studies suggest also huge numbers of people infected. Uh, and I, I believe that also U.S. and Europe are very far in, in the process. Yeah. But in your, in your policies world... Where you're you're you know you're taking the precautions in the nursing homes and you're gonna uh, you can avert maybe half the de- I mean half the deaths are there, but what is the what policy for the 45 year old American overweight, you know, what policy yeah. would you institute for them? So so you need to protect everyone with basic measures. So social okay. distancing does make sense. Okay. Uh, masks whenever you cannot avoid. Uh, okay. Being with others and especially in congested places, I think that uh, anything that you can do to help people work from uh, home rather than be there. Okay. Uh, protecting people who are disadvantaged, you, you need to recast the whole structure of of welfare and social protection, which we never had, unfortunately, in this country, yeah. and most countries, unfortunately, do not have. Uh, so th- these are the people who eventually will be the relatively young ones who die or, or get serious disease. And then the tools that you're not going to employ are the business closures, I guess I'm trying to delineate. I what would you, definitely yeah. not close schools. Okay. I, I yes. think that this is devastating. And I would be very cautious uh, and I would try to avoid closing businesses, uh, provided that we all think about ways that you minimize risk exposure in businesses. So there's lots of businesses that can work with very little uh, contact between people. Let me ask you this. Um, you know, we've been talking about the policy, but I wonder if the policy is dwarfed by the news i mean i wonder if i mean this is the, this news the, the news that we have here is a news that is optimized for attention i mean it is in the attention commodity the attention is the commodity of the news yeah. and and i i really do wonder in some of these i mean i guess the open question in some of these lockdown papers will be what did what was the delta on the lockdown if you scare the crap out of everyone and they're in the house all the time they don't want to go out they're all scared the delta lockdown in terms of behavioral change is like so small you know the lockdown quote unquote lockdown the the rule has very little um impact because it was the behavior that was altered um what how do you how do you tease these two apart philosophically and you know i don't think that we're we're doing a service to our community to to people by scaring them you know by terrorizing them I, I think that it may work for the first day, for the first week, maybe two weeks. I don't know. Some people may be scared and terrorized longer. <laughs> but uh, this is this is a chronic situation. We're already over a year into this. And uh, it's likely to take much, much longer. And if you ask when will SARS-CoV-2 go away, it may be never. <laughs> that's, that's so, 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 yeah. so I don't know for sure. Uh, you know, I, I, I would be the... F- most happy person on earth to see it completely eradicated. Yeah. But you cannot really live by terrorizing people. And it's unfortunate that, that news media, they, they just live out of terror at the moment. And they should find a different business, please. <laughs> well, I guess I think all of these things, the, the commodity is attention. Twitter, Facebook, uh, media. The commodity is your eyes looking at it longer. And I think, you know, I, I used to tell this joke, um, and I think it's true. You know, um, I'm one of the few people on earth who one of the things that really bothers me is if there's a new cancer drug and I think it's not that great and somebody says it's a game changer or something like that. There are not a lot of people like me who get really irked when that happens. And Twitter, for a while, for a year, it showed me every time anyone <laughs> in the whole country said that. It found a way to put it right in front of my eyes and I would always take the bait. I'd say, this is wrong, this is stupid, this is wrong. I would always take the bait um, before I realized what it was doing. It was playing me. It knew that that would get a reaction out of me. It knew I was going to respond. Um, because, the, it, you know, 
for yeah. all the stupidity of AI and machine learning, it's quite good at this thing in optimizing your consumption of the product. Um, and that explains why it's hard. That explains why your Wikipedia page is vandalized because it it get, because it's a to, to say something bad about somebody who was um, has done a lot of very important work is atten- it grabs attention, you know. To 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 tarnish somebody who has a long legacy, that's why my, if they tarnish me, it's a little less because I'm younger than you. I've do- not done as much and. Maybe I'll never. And now, after all this, I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> I'm not going to. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm just going to see patience and get the fuck out of it. You know, after all this, it's like give it. Yeah, quit while you're ahead. Um, but no, you know, I think. But it, 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 it's absolutely and 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 Fauci. That's also why Fauci may get um, a different a different group of people maybe going after him. But I bet he gets his name is mentioned more on Twitter than your name in a derogatory manner. Um, yeah, because that's, that's very sad. Because yeah. he's a, he's an amazing scientist and he doesn't deserve that. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I I wrote in in defense of Tony Fauci in in the BMJ when I I wrote that piece about petitions. Yes. And uh, I I think we need to find ways to defend good people, well-intentioned people, serious people, uh, people who are likely to bring us back to normality. There will be those who scream. There will be those who accuse. Those who uh, feel that they can make a career out of smearing, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's one way to make a career. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> but I guess my argument would be, I would say, um, you, you, these platforms have to be broken up. I, I, I don't see a way out of it. I think they have steadily gained attention this way. The, the amount of, um, the media and the Twitter are just a, 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 a snake eating its own tail. They're, they're just, they, the, the people they quote in the news stories are the people who tweet. And they quote them because they'll tweet the article, so they get more clicks. And then they quote them again. And some of these people, they may have uh, once used the restroom at Harvard. And they say in the bio, Harvard, affiliate, you know, I, I was at Harvard too. Um, yeah, but, yeah. you know. But anyway, I don't... I don't I, no, you're, yeah. you're, you're right. And you don't want to silence the news. You don't want to silence Twitter. I mean, you, you know, you need to have communication in, in the society. And so you, you, you need media. You need news. Uh, but uh, I, I think that they're shooting their own foot by doing this. Because I, I cannot believe that the, the vast uh, proportion of the population, regardless of their education status, can tolerate that for too long. I, I think that there is already fatigue, and I think that there will be more fatigue uh, very quickly. And, and then you will have these very sad people who just scream uh, in social media or in media or in news or yeah. whatever, and nobody cares about them. That, that's really sad. I, I, I feel for them. Yeah, <laughs> You're more optimistic than I am because I think that the vaccines were great news, and they came out with that. And then yeah. yet they, they have found a way to make it not great news. Yesterday, they retracted a headline that said AstraZeneca dramatically reduces asymptomatic spread. And they changed it to may reduce asymptomatic spread. Mm-hmm. They're saying the new mantra, you get vaccinated, you have to live your life like you never were vaccinated. It's as if you never got it. As if you never got it. You got to keep going on. And then they say the variants, you know, um, uh, the variants are way more deadly. They're coming. Their vaccine escape, even though you know Moderna and Pfizer put out data that's saying that actually they get gener- they get generate really good neutralizing antibodies yeah. at the dose yeah. given. Um, they're trying to stretch the feet. They're getting a little more fear out of this, I think, um, and that is a powerful narrative. I, I I think that they will be running out of ammunition uh, mm-hmm. now. Of course, if you go down the path of mutations, there's tens of thousands of mutations. If you sell a mutation every month, you can probably hey make we it. we did that in cancer for a few <laughs> decades. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Okay, let me ask you this. I know our time is probably running. I guess the question I have for you is, um, and we didn't talk about shielding as much, but we could talk about that too if you want. Um, the question I have for you is the next crisis. I mean, you know, COVID-19 is a pandemic. It just, it's, it's a unique crisis. It's a crisis that requires the input of scientists, the input of the academy. And ironically, at a moment where we needed the academy the most, the academy was um, neutered because you could not have any in-person meetings. There's no in-person meetings, so we have lost a great forum. Because I think many of the people who disagree with you, if um, you were all brought to a physical table and you had to physically eat lunch together, eat dinner together, have a, dr- have a drink together, and spend a day in conference, you will find that actually you probably agree on 90% of things. I think they agree about with everything you said about the nursing homes and how you would handle it. I think that the difference where the disagreement would be would be that ultimate stay-at-home order, that ultimate, you know. And I think... 
But I think there's a lot more agreement than there's disagreement. Um, but that, that couldn't happen. But I guess my question is the next crisis. The next crisis I don't think will be a pandemic crisis, but it will be some crisis where you'll need scientists to give their input. Um, you'll need politicians to weigh what public wants, what public will take. Um, what, how could we be better positioned for that moment? What, what structural changes should be different for that moment, for the next crisis, be it climate, be it uh, astronomical, some debris coming to the earth, you know, some, some fragment of debris coming at this planet? Um, I think assuming that a lot of what we see here will, will play it out itself out there. I don't know. To be honest, uh, I just don't know because I don't know what the next crisis would be. We have lots of threats that we're facing as humanity. We don't know exactly when they will strike and how exactly they will strike. In principle, we just need to be prepared to deal with them in as tolerant uh, a mode as possible to diversity of opinion and diversity of evidence. Uh, I think that we need science. Everybody agrees that we need science. It's, it's just an issue of, of some science <laughs> not being tolerated. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, so be tolerant to uh, diversity of ideas, especially if it's something that we don't know about. If it's something new, it's something that w we haven't seen a thousand times before, we see it for the first time. Uh, try to get people who are the best minds attracted to work on it rather than inhibited to work on it because if, if you start vandalizing and uh, attacking with ad hominem attacks, uh, scientists, then you will probably not get the best people interested to work in it. They will say, I will just stick to my yeah. uh, other field of whatever I'm doing. And try to dissociate science from politics. Uh, a scientist cannot really be a politician looking at uh, what did uh, Trump say yesterday, what did Biden say today, what did uh, uh, Merkel uh, have in mind to say in a week from now. Yeah. You, you can do science in, the, in this way. You, you, you need to do science as objectively as possible, as unbiased as possible. Don't care a bit about what all these politicians say and just defend your science with arguments. Uh, what the crisis is going to be, I have no clue. I, yeah. I, I have absolutely no clue. I think if I were to one observation that I wonder if you share is that COVID-19, the same virus, COVID-07, would have been very different. COVID-07, George W. Bush was the president. People didn't like him, but it wasn't like this. You know, he wasn't so... Every time you look at the guy, you want to... Oh, you're just so <laughs> angry. He, you know, he didn't inspire that. Or well, let's say COVID-2011 with yeah. Barack Obama. A very, yeah. at least within the academy of Barack Obama... Um, I think, put people 50-50. There are people who liked him. There are people who are more conservative mm -hmm. in the academy. Mm -hmm. A Trump in the academy, it's 97-3. I mean, he, <laughs> he cuts, he <laughs> finds a way in the, in the academy. He cuts everyone, you know, he, yeah. people don't like yeah. him in the academy. Um, the other thing I think was different, the power of the tech industry. Without the Zoom, without the Amazon Prime delivery, without the Uber Eats, the wealthy amongst us who were happy to accept lockdown because, you know what, if I'm rich and I have a house in, in Atherton, I wish I had a house in Atherton, <laughs> I can't, aff can't afford an apartment in Atherton, you know, if I had a house in Atherton with a big yard, a backyard, um, you know, people I know are getting backyard patio renovations over the summer, you know, all the things that are sold out in the stores, kayaks and bicycles, and, you know, if you have money, you can live good, and then every day you get sushi delivered to your house and Thai food the next day and Indian yeah. food. And, and permanent vacation. Permanent vacation, <laughs> and... Then the highest risk in the data set that came out of UCSF was line cooks, people who are cooking the food, mm. highest risk of SARS-CoV-2 yeah. in the state. Yeah. And the irony is, uh, you know, um, whether you get a takeout or you eat it there, their risk is the same because they're cooking in a closed kitchen. People are maybe indifferent to that. Um, so this pandemic, it never hurt people with money. And when you don't hurt people with money, they can take it forever. And they have Zoom, they can go to their meetings, and they can. And, and the other thing is, if we didn't have Zoom in 2011 or 20, 2004, there would be layoffs. And if there are layoffs of a lot of upper middle class people, people are not going to put up with it. So COVID 19 is both the virus, the IFR, who is susceptible. It's also who the president was, divisive guy, especially in the academy. And it's also the ability for rich people to segregate themselves. And if any of these things were different, it would be it would have been a different ball game. But we got it all, and that's why for one I, year. I, it, it's, uh, it's the perfect storm, as you describe it. And uh, we live in a society with tremendous inequality, with injustice, with racism. It, it's just horrible. 
And both the pandemic and even more the response to the pandemic is making all of these problems worse. So that's something that I am biased. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so my bias is that I do want to diminish inequality. I do want to diminish injustice. I do want to eradicate racism. I, I do want to, to create a society that cares about people. And I think that the response to the pandemic showed that we just don't care about anyone other than ourselves. I, I belong to that 1% probably, yeah. you know. I, I'm not at Atherton, but, but uh, Menlo Park is <laughs> <laughs> not too bad. <laughs> like yeah. the, the neighborhood yeah. next to it. Um, and I, I feel ashamed about how we have, we have treated our fellow citizens, the, the weak, the disadvantaged, the, those that didn't have opportunities. And we're not giving them opportunities. We're just taking away opportunities for, from them. We're just generating more inequality with, with what we're doing. So, so that, that's probably the most horrible thing about the response when, when you look at it from, uh, from a distance. And I, I felt very sad that people who call themselves progressives uh, or you know, they say we belong to the left, they just shut their eyes to that, most of them. Yeah. And to, to, to give you something that sounds like very funny, um, as you know, many of the people who attacked me in the U.S., they say that they belong to the left. Yeah. And, uh, and they say you're a right winger. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As everything so, you just said is the so platform in, of the right. In, yeah. in uh, Greece, yeah. the main attacks that I received using the BuzzFeed ammunition came from the alt-right. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Uh, so the, 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 <laughs> main, the main driver who used the BuzzFeed uh, ammunition is uh, a politician uh, who is advocating uh, for uh, immigrants to be uh, deported to uninhabited islands. Oh, I see, I see. And mm -hmm. uh, also oh, uh, has been... Uh, has offered to be a witness for the defense for a terrorist organization that has assassinated both Greeks and Americans the oh 17th of November. So, so you see that quote-unquote progressives and, and left-wing and quote-unquote right-wing, uh, when it comes to nonsense, they're the same. Yeah. I think I uh, share your... Uh, I didn't know that you have earned the eye of both, <laughs> 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 both sides of the political aisle. Um, <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, I, I, I think that one of the challenges with politics and science is that they are um, not compatible in some degree, which is that all, at least, to my, I, you know, I grew up in this, I only know American politics, and in American politics is, um, there, there are often things in a political party that uh, just don't make sense from a logical standpoint. And even, you know, I, I identify as a progressive and I'm a supporter, I think, I'm close to Elizabeth Warren in that I think fiscal policy is the way for lasting change in the society. Um, and 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 I agree with all the things you espoused. Um, but there's always things on in any political party that just don't make sense, and that they actually might not work. And I wish there were a political party that was just, um, you know, here is what we want to accomplish, and we're willing to use whatever methods to get there if they work. And if they don't work, we're not going to use them. The party of evidence-based policy. You know, that's the party that I've that's always wanted. That's a great wanted. party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me when it's launched. <laughs> I know. Well, I don't know. Now is not a good day for it. Um, well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's any topic that we should we should talk about before. I, I think we covered a lot. Okay, we covered a lot. I think. Um, I don't know. I would say that um, that I, I think that Wikipedia page caught my eye, and it caught my eye, and it wasn't just your page. I looked at a lot of pages that were related. Um, and there is a bias, and the bias is that the pe the kinds of people who write those Wikipedia pages are, I think, um, in the camp favoring lockdowns, yeah. and um, in the camp of wearing that sort of mask I described, that maybe a World War One rally. I mean, I don't know where this mask came from, but this gentleman had the mask in the picture. Um, which is that, um, and there's a, there's a camp that says school shouldn't open until the risk is zero. I've heard that argument. I find it troublesome because the risk was never zero. We always sent the kids to school. There's no there's no such thing as zero risk. Zero risk, you don't live in life. Um, it's how do you mitigate the risk? Um, and I guess I would say um, I think I think the I think that the culture will change on this issue a little bit. I think the article, the way the article is written now, won't be the way it's written in ten years from now. I think it'll be written differently. Well, I, maybe if I can get five thousand dollars from some airline <laughs> owner, I could pay to change the Wikipedia. You could page. pay to, hit, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know you were in it for the long con. You know, there a lot of scientists. They decide in the first or second year to work with the industry. You waited. You waited about twenty, twenty-five years in your career, and then There's all for that five thousand. Right <laughs> <moment. laughs> 
<laughs> there's always you probably could fly wherever you wanted on JetBlue. Yeah, yeah. There's always the right moment. Um, Galapagos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for doing this. I think Thank it'll you, be, um, people will listen and, um, yeah, and uh, hopefully we'll someday do a chapter where we never talk about COVID again. So Brilliant. Yeah. I look forward to it. Zero COVID. Zero COVID. <laughs> yes, that's the real zero COVID. You've been listening to season three of Plenary Session. Plenary Session is produced by Kiana Klossner. Music by Ian Straley and Audrey Tran. The views expressed on Plenary Session are those of whoever said it and no one else. Plenary Session is not medical advice. Follow us on Twitter at plenary underscore session. Until next time.